Millions of pilgrims flock to this small town in Portugal. Was a vision of the Virgin Mary really seen here? In Ireland, believers and non-believers say they see this statue move. Is it a miracle or does science have an explanation? An apparition of the Virgin Mary on a church wall, but has an investigator unlocked its secrets? Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communication satellite. Now in retreat in Sri Lanka, he ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. This fishing harbor at Nagambo has a special significance in the history of Sri Lanka. It's here that Portuguese colonists first made landfall in the 16th century. They were after the spices that grow wild in the jungle, especially the cinnamon. The Portuguese rule was brief, only 60 years, but they left this island one enduring legacy, a network of magnificent Roman Catholic churches. Like all Catholics, the worshippers of Nagumbo have a special reverence for the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of Christ. Back in Europe, over the centuries, a tiny handful of her followers have claimed that she has actually appeared to them in person, usually with a message for mankind. Such visions inspire both extraordinary mass devotion and controversy. The faithful accept them as miracles, while skeptics probe for more down-to-earth explanations. By neat coincidence, the answers may be found in the homeland of those who brought the Roman Catholic faith here, Portugal. They come from nearby. They come from far away. In their stockinged feet, in walking boots, and finally on their knees. From all over the world, four million pilgrims a year flock to Fatima. The pilgrims are drawn here because in 1917, some children said they saw a vision. The faithful believe that Fatima is the site of a true miracle. Today, Fatima welcomes pilgrims in their hundreds of thousands. The shrine is a far cry from the simple pastures that lay here in 1917, when the three young visionaries came out to graze their sheep. Lucia de Jesus, who was 10, came here with her cousins Francisco and Jacinta, who were nine and seven years old. It was May the 13th. At midday, the children said, a bright light heralded a vision of the Virgin. She told them to return on the 13th day of the next five months. I think they saw, because they were sincere, they had no influence from their parents, from other persons, so they were alone in their sincerity. I think they, they have really seen a vision, yes. Across Europe, shrines have been established where children had visions. At Lourdes in France, Bernadette Subiru claims she saw the Virgin in 1879. In 1961, youngsters at Garabandel in Spain proclaimed that the Virgin Mary was appearing to them. And in 1981, six children at Medjugorje in Bosnia said the Virgin was bringing them messages of hope. At Fatima, the highlight of each day is the evening procession, when the Virgin is paraded among the pilgrims. It was on this spot in 1917 that the Virgin promised the children a miracle for all to see. One hundred thousand people turned up on October the 13th. The day started with heavy rain. 
Those that had come to scoff mocked the faithful for expecting to see anything in such conditions. But just before noon, the downpour stopped and the sun appeared. Father Gera's predecessor as parish priest wrote down this testimony. It's noon now, it's the time of operation. And that time, I began seeing the sun who turned around, turned around, turned around, and detached against me so that I had only the time to kneel on the mud and to ask God, my God, pardon me because I die here. Every person there, believer or non-believer, saw the same thing. The sun appeared to move in the sky. There was a blue quality to the light. The sun appeared to get larger and larger. They thought it was coming right at them. Many feared for their lives. The newspaper headlines reported the sun dancing in the sky. Thousands of witnesses, they said, had seen a miracle at Fatima. Can science explain why the sun danced that day? Dr. Stuart Campbell thinks the crowd saw not a miracle, but a rarely observed atmospheric phenomenon. Naturally, I was looking for a logical, rational, scientific explanation, but I was aware of that dust in the atmosphere can cause the sun and sometimes the moon to change colour. In fact, a blue sun was recorded in September 1950 at the site where Campbell now stands. Scientists at the Royal Scottish Observatory discovered it was caused by a cloud of tiny smoke particles. These came from a forest fire in Canada. They'd been carried thousands of miles to Britain by the wind. I concluded that the same cause must have caused the blue sun at uh, Fatima. And the only reason there could be fine particles above Fatima at the time would be a cloud, a fairly large cloud of fine particles moving across Portugal, Western Portugal at that time. Campbell believes the crowds at Fatima saw the sun through a dust cloud thrown up by a volcano thousands of miles away. I looked at all the explosions of volcanoes. It has to be an explosive volcano for the dust to be thrown up in the atmosphere. And there was a Costa Rican explosion. A volcano in Costa Rica had exploded about a few weeks before this event, although it's only about 10 degrees north of the equator. And it could be dust from that explosion that caused this, this event. Campbell's suspicions were confirmed when he checked the winds prevailing at the time. They were blowing in the right direction from Costa Rica to have created a blue sun in Portugal. It's a simple meteorological phenomenon. Uh, the reason people thought the sun was advancing towards them was as the cloud got thinner, the sun would get brighter, and people often mistake a brightening object for an object moving towards them. So they were used to this dull, bluish sun. Suddenly it gets brighter and yellow and comes, seems to come advancing towards the Earth, which is what they describe, but it was just the sun returning to its normal brightness. But Dr. Campbell agrees one mystery remains. He cannot explain how the miracle occurred exactly when the children predicted. Why it happened just when these children were saying, look at the sun, I can't really say, except that it was a remarkable coincidence that just as they were claiming that there was going to be a miracle, there was a rare phenomenon occurring right above their heads. It was a remarkable coincidence. In Fatima, four million pilgrims a year believe the explanation lies in more than coincidence and not in the realm of science. I think it's a question of faith, even for scientists. They cannot prove that it was really a natural event. They cannot prove it. So if they cannot prove it, they believe it. They believe it natural. I believe it supernatural. It's a question of faith. I've noticed two things that most reports of sightings of the Virgin Mary have in common. The first is that they usually come from children, some so young that we should be wary of their testimony. The second is that they occur in very remote places, such as the village of Knock in the far west of Ireland. In 1979, the world's press landed on a vast runway at Ireland's newest international airport. It was built thanks to a campaign by this man, Father James Horan. 
He persuaded the Irish government that Horan International was the only place that could accommodate the jet loads of pilgrims that flew in to visit his parish. For it was here a century before that an extraordinary vision of the Virgin was seen on the wall of his church. A hundred years ago, Nock had a modest church. Its south gable wall was plain with just a single window. But at eight o'clock on the 21st of August, during a rainstorm, the wall is said to have shone with an apparition of the Virgin Mary flanked by two saints. Soon after, Nock became a place of pilgrimage, especially for the disabled. Today, an investigator has commissioned an exact replica of the gable end wall of Nock Parish Church. He needs it for an experiment, which he believes will explain what was really going on when the Virgin appeared. Melvin Harris insists the measurements of this replica must be exact. For this experiment, the position of the window is crucial, and he needs everything in place as he believes it was on the night of the apparition. Most important of all, he needs a magic lantern. It's the forerunner of today's slide projector, and Harris believes it holds the key to unlock the mystery. He also needs darkness, and he needs rain to create the exact conditions of the night the vision was seen. Melvin Harris looked at reports from the time. He discovered that the local priest was unpopular with his parishioners. A miracle at the church would have changed everything. Harris believes the priest acquired a magic lantern and a mirror. He used the lantern to project a slide through the window. The mirror then deflected the image down to the wall below. The result, an apparition seemingly from nowhere and with no detectable beam of light in front. What it is. Harris is a stickler for detail. He's ordered a rainstorm from the local fireman. Everything must be exactly as it was on the night of the vision of Nock. Now the image Harris has reproduced on the wall can be compared with the testimony of the original eyewitnesses. They described the figure as being life-sized and say they're about five foot five. Uh, they also said that there were lines around the figures. There was no question of them being flesh and blood. Statues from beginning to end. No one ever said that they saw a movement and no one ever said they saw anything that resembled a human being. It was this testimony that convinced Harris that the priest had used a magic lantern slide to create the apparition. Evidence from witnesses further away added support to his theory. One or two witnesses from a long way off spoke of a great circle of light on the gable end. And uh, that itself hints at a magic lantern. And eyewitnesses nearer the church found they could stand next to the gable without casting shadows. Harris says that proves that a mirror was used to throw the image down onto the wall, and the magic lantern would have been hidden behind the church window. I think that today we've solved the mystery of knock in the most efficient way possible. With the right equipment at the right time, one can create, recreate the images that were seen by the people at knock all those years ago. And it can be done. Miraculous manifestations of the Virgin Mary don't seem to be confined to visions. Sometimes statues of her are said to move in the most mysterious ways. In the south of Ireland, a wayside shrine regularly attracts crowds of awestruck pilgrims, amazed because in the evening the figure seems to come alive. Ballin Spittle stands on the coast in the southwest of Ireland. For years, this tiny hub of the local farming community buzzed with nothing more than the sound of tractors. But in 1985, all that changed, and the world beat a path to Ballin Spittle. The object of their attention? The Virgin Mary in this hillside grotto outside the village. By day, the people of this community tend the grotto and its garden lovingly. They believe the place has a unique quality. 
couldn't put your finger on it, like, but there's something special about the place. It's just like praying, really, when you're working for Our Lady. We want to make the place beautiful for her, and she has been very good to us. Came here and visited us in 1985, and she's here with us all the time in a very special way. That special way is the belief held by hundreds of thousands who've been here that the statue actually moves at night. In Cork City, Sergeant John Murray has seen many things in his lifetime as a policeman, but none so strange as his experience the first time he went to the grotto. As I faced the grotto, the statue appeared to actually leave the grotto and move to my left. And I would say, and I, I, again, I have to... It's something that I will never forget because it's deeply embedded in my mind. It was such a definite movement that it, it, the people all gasped as one and they stopped in mid-sentence and then when it stopped, they carried on again. But it was a very frightening, very definite and positive movement. On the following morning, I stopped at the grotto and I said, if there's something wrong here, I want to know about it. I expected to find that somebody had interfered with it, that there was some sort of trick wiring or something going on. So I climbed the grotto and I caught the um, statue by the shoulders and it's man-sized or woman-sized statue and I shook, tried to shake it. And there was no indication, no sign of any interference or anything unusual. It was plainly and simply a, a statue set in, in a grotto and very, very, very much uh, permanently fixed. John Murray has been back to the shrine many times since then, drawn there by what he saw that night. The bells of the angelus call you pray in sweet tones announcing... First to observe it back in 1985 was Cathy O'Mahony and her children. They were out one evening for a walk. As dusk fell, they stopped at the grotto. Kind of shimmered, you know, in and out. You know, it was as if um, she'd wave that way and then she'd wave that way. I saw it move back and forth like that and from side to side, the top half of the statue. You don't have to be a Catholic to see the statue move. And we don't think we're special because we saw it move. I mean, thousands of people have seen it move and Our Lady speaks to everybody in, in different ways, you know. At Cork University, Jurek Kirakowski was intrigued by the mystery on his doorstep. He interviewed eyewitnesses and went to Ballinspittle. He too saw the Virgin move, but guessed that physical factors must lie behind the phenomenon. Firmly stuck down, is it? Yeah. Good. Don't moving. In the laboratory, with a statue, some fairy lights and some human guinea pigs, okay, he's set to work. Can the lights now, please? Natalie, I think we'll start with you. Can you look at the base of the statue? Right. OK, now, there are two essential aspects to this phenomenon. One is, most people don't realise it, but they move a lot, especially if they haven't got a visual reference. So if you're standing in a dark field, in a, dar in a darkened environment, you will sway more than if you're standing in a lightened environment, you know, in daylight or in a lightened room. The second item is that we know that our eyes react very quickly to bright light, and they react a lot more slowly to dim light. If you put these two together, what you see is these people uh, standing in a darkened environment. They're swaying around. They most probably don't realize they're swaying. The image of the statue is going backwards and forwards on the back of their eye. The lightened portions of the image, the bright portions of the image, actually seem to be going faster than the darker portions which gives rise to if someone is swaying backwards and forwards like this, precisely a gentle swaying motion. Right. Uh, do you want me to try? All right. Uh, Lex, how's that? 
Um, well, the halo is moving again a little more. But I right. have the body moved a small bit in comparison to the dark areas. Right. Once you know that it's a combination of the movement and the light from the statue, we can simulate both of these effects in a laboratory to give the balance spittle effect. Even at the height of the war tearing apart the former Yugoslavia, the cameras proved that pilgrims would defy shells and sniper bullets to visit the shrine at Medjugorje. They've congregated here through bad times and good. Indeed, in 1992, when shells hit the church but failed to explode, Medjugorje's reputation grew still further as a place of miracles. In 1985, six young children came down from this hill and announced that they'd seen a vision of the Virgin Mary. She appeared again to them on consecutive Fridays and the word spread. As at Fatima 60 years before, a vision by a group of children made the place a magnet for the faithful. It was said that during their visions, the children were truly in trance. They claimed to hear nothing and to be totally unaware of their surroundings. But in Montreal, Canada, a professor of parapsychology decided to investigate. Louis Belanger took a video camera to record the children in their regular trance. But he says what he recorded calls into question the state of ecstasy the children experience. When they see the Virgin Mary, the visionaries claim that they are totally disconnected from the environment, that they don't hear other people, that they don't see other people, that they are completely concentrated on the, the apparition of the Virgin Mary. Every week, the Virgin is said to appear to the young visionaries at a Friday service. Belanger set up his camera and sat back to watch. Now, they made the sign of the cross and uh, they begin the prayer, Our Father. And during that prayer, suddenly there is the beginning of the ecstasy kneel down and they are in contact with uh, the Virgin Mary. If they're truly in ecstasy, nothing should distract the children. But suddenly, to Belanger's later amazement, an onlooker called Jean-Louis jabbed his hand towards Witzka on the right. At the moment of filming, I did not see that. Just afterwards, I saw that there was a commotion in the chapel. Everybody was disturbed because Witzka had reacted. Jean-Louis made a threat gesture against the eyes of Witzka, towards the eyes of Witzka, and uh, she reacted. And it was, uh, for uh, Jean-Louis, uh, an important disappointment. Still frames from Belanger's video at the moment of the hand lunging at Witzka show her clearly recoiling from the jabbing fingers. Then the fingers of Jean-Louis are going back. Still no reaction for Witzka. A slight reaction, closing of her eyes. And then on the next picture, you have the spectacular movement of the uh, uh, face of uh, Witzka. She is reacting, going back. After the ecstasy, I had forgotten to stop the camera, and suddenly, Witzka comes in with somebody else. She wanted to explain why she'd moved. In her trance, she'd been trying to prevent the Virgin from dropping the infant Jesus. So she said, when I arrived in the chapel, and everything was okay, when the ecstasy began, I saw nobody, and I heard nobody, except the Virgin Mary. And the Virgin Mary had the infant Jesus in her arms. And suddenly, I thought, said Witzka, that the infant Jesus would fall on the floor. So to impeach that, I made a gesture to impeach the infant Jesus to fall on the floor. And she thought that it would explain the reaction that she had against uh, the threat gesture made by Jean-Louis. But in the end, does it really matter whether visions of the Virgin Mary are genuine or not? 
Because to millions, they bring comfort and hope in an otherwise bleak and painful world.